kudos, this seems like a very rigid set of rules. Yeah, so it's rigid with y'all. The cool thing is that when you do it properly, is it going to feel rigid to other people? Yes, which is what we want to do. And you're not going to come across as crazy. You're going to come across as understanding, compassionate, and firm. It is rigid. That's what people, they don't, we don't want to be doormats, right? Like there's going to be some rigidity because at some point you're saying no, and you're putting up a wall between their actions and what you're allowing. That requires rigidity. The question is, how can we optimize that process for compliance on their part, as well as maintaining the relationship? So let's talk about setting boundaries. So the tricky thing is that everyone sort of says, hey, like it's really important to set good boundaries, man. So I remember when I was in residency, uh, the, the residency program director at the time, I, I was kind of asking her, you know, what's one of the most useful things that you've learned that you wish you knew earlier? And she was like, the most useful skill I ever learned was learning how to say no. And so, you know, you hear things like this, right? That learning to say no is, is important. It's important to like set healthy boundaries, like Set healthy boundaries around technology and set healthy boundaries with your parents and set healthy boundaries with your friends and set healthy boundaries with your significant other. Just like set healthy boundaries, man or woman. But like no one ever teaches you, like, how do you set a boundary? Like, how does that actually happen? So today what we're going to talk about is like share with you all five important steps to setting a healthy boundary. The first is actually articulating the boundary. The second is how to implement the boundary. The third is common pitfalls. And this is something that I think is like grossly undereducated because setting a boundary is not easy, right? Like actually maintaining it is not just about the other person. It is oftentimes about you. So yeah, I, I promise I will, you know, I'm going to break up with this person and I'm never going to see them again. I'm going to go no contact with them. And let me text them two weeks from now when I'm feeling lo lonely on a Friday night. Right. So what are some of the pitfalls to setting boundaries and then like some in the moment tips it with enforcing boundaries? So we can sort of say, OK, here's how you articulate a boundary. Here are the steps to implement it. Here are some things that you watch out for. But in the moment when push comes to shove and you have to set a boundary with someone, it can be very, very hard. Right. Because you're afraid of particular things. So how what is the right way to in the moment like lay out a boundary with someone, enforce a boundary. And the last thing that I think, once again, is not talked about is after you lay a boundary with someone, after you enforce a boundary, what do you do then, right? So like a big risk around boundary setting is that if you have friends or parents or, or you know, significant others and you set a boundary with them, there's oftentimes like consequences to setting that boundary, right? So how do you manage those consequences? Because it's the fear of those consequences that oftentimes keeps us from setting the boundary in the first place or enforcing the boundary. I don't like it when my friends make fun of me, but if I say something to them, they're just going to make fun of me more. Or if I say something to them, they're going to think that I'm not fun to hang around with and I may not get invited next time. Right? So like when you set boundaries with people, sometimes there are consequences. And so one of the things that I found is like a really, really undertaught skill is not just how to set a boundary. But after you set a boundary, how do you interact with the person to try to smooth things over and maintain a healthy relationship or hopefully repair whatever small rupture you have? Okay, so let's dive in. So step number one. So at the end of this, hopefully what you will be able to do is set a boundary, like articulate a boundary, implement a boundary, troubleshoot some of the pitfalls, get some like kind of coaching on in the moment what you should say or do when like push comes to shove and you really want to, you know, waver on your boundary. And then the last thing that I think is really important is like at the end of this, hopefully you'll have an idea of, okay, after I set a boundary and I feel guilty and like, I'm afraid that people don't like me, how do I interact with that person afterward to kind of patch things up and make sure that things are okay? Okay. So step number one of boundary setting is articulating your boundary. So this is where we basically figure out, okay, what specifically is our boundary? And this is a, a, a thing that I think is like, you know, you got to be careful about because if you want someone to adhere or respect a particular boundary, it has to be like clearly laid out. And the first problem that people run into is that they don't oftentimes like 
clearly articulate what the boundary is. And so if I sort of say, like, I want you to stop treating me this way, it's like, how does that person know what this way is? Right. So like you're kind of setting them up to fail. I don't like it when you talk to me like this. So I'm not saying that those feelings aren't valid and they're absolutely there for a reason. But if we're thinking about a relationship, you need to be able to articulate it so that the other person understands what you mean. OK, so we're going to start by articulating boundaries. Second thing that we're going to do is how to implement boundaries. Third thing we're going to do is pitfalls. So what are some of the traps or things that you have to watch out for when it comes to boundary setting? Number four is in the moment tips. Right? When, when you are setting a boundary with your friend and they aggro and the boss music starts to play, what do you do in that moment, right? How do you, how do you manage the aggro of your friend? And then last thing is after the encounter is over, how do you repair the relationship? So aftermath of boundary setting. Okay. So let's start with number one, articulating a boundary. So the first thing that I'd say is if you're trying to set boundaries with people, Okay, there are a couple of key tips to understand. The first is the earlier in the relationship, the easier it is. Okay, this is first thing to understand. Number two, it's easier to loosen a boundary than it is to tighten it. So this is part of the problem with like, so people who are dealing with, let's say, entitled parents, narcissistic parents, entitled family members. If you haven't set a boundary with them, any kind of tightening that you do on the boundary is going to be met with a ton of resistance, right? Whereas like if you're starting a relationship with someone, you can sort of lay out what your boundaries are, are early on. But if there's an expectation of behavior already in place... Running contrary to that expectation is going to encounter more resistance, okay? So what we want to do, first of all, is make the boundary very clear. So this should be like actions that you articulate. So I'll kind of give you all an example. So let's say that you're talking to your parents and your parents have forbidden you to date because you are an Asian or South Asian person or many other cultures, I suppose. So no dating in middle school, certainly not. That's absurd. No dating in high school, no, that's not something that our people do. And in, in college, you should be focusing on studies. And then like something happens where like your 25th birthday rolls around. And then depending on your gender, you may get a little bit of leeway one way or the other. 25th birthday rolls around, 26th birthday rolls around. Now it's like, okay, like now it's time to get married. Like why aren't you? And then 27th birthday rolls around, why aren't you married yet? 28th birthday rolls around, and it's like, what's wrong with you? Everyone else is getting married. It would, it would calm me down so much if you could just get married. Like, don't you understand how much I worry about you and what's going to happen about your future? And now it's time, beta. Now it's time. Now it's time, beta. It's time. It's time. It's time. Oh my goodness, it's time. So when you're sort of dealing with this, the first thing that you have to do is clearly articulate what the boundary is. So like you have to figure out, okay, because remember, this is a behavior that you want someone else to do. So the boundary should be behavioral in nature. It can't be like some kind of emotion that you, they, you want them to prevent. Like you don't want them to evoke an emotion. Like that's not a boundary you can set. You can't, they can't control how they make you feel. They can only control what they say. So you want your, your boundary to be like very, very clear and very behavioral in nature. So for example, for this person, what I would recommend is when we talk on the phone, Don't ask about personal or romantic relationships, right? So like, it doesn't mean it, it just, this is the thing. Like when we talk on the phone, 
Right. So I'm, I'm assuming a couple things that, you know, you don't live with your parents or they're not physically there with you or things like that. And you can kind of say like, hey, like every time we talk on the phone, like you keep on hammering me with the same stuff. Right. You're always asking me when I'm going to get married. I'll tell you when I have information going forward. I would appreciate it if you did not ask me about this. OK, this is where you kind of want to like be very, very clear about an ask. Now, for people who have like very, very pushy parents or very loose boundaries or things like that. The other thing is remember that it's easier to loosen than it is to tighten. So if we are implementing boundaries for people, like remember this is that an overtime process. So what you want to do, it's longitudinal in nature. So what you want to do is like you can't fix everything all at once. And it's hard to ask people to make drastic adjustments overnight. So what we're going to do is start by implementing a tiny, tiny boundary, right? So this is where we are. This is where we want to go. We're not going to go like from here to here in one step. We're going to go right here, which they can manage. And then we're going to go here. And then we're going to go here. And then we may take a bigger step, right? But generally speaking, we want to tighten our boundaries very, very gradually, much like the way that I tighten my belt over my dad gut, right? So what we want to do is like be very, very clear with a behavioral instruction, okay? Second thing that we want to do is provide a very simple reason. This is important. We do not want to provide complex reasons. We do not want to provide, like, intense reasons. We do not want to provide justifications, logic, we do not want to provide scientific fact. We do not want to talk to them about how they make us feel when they do that. We want to provide a very, very simple reason. Ideally, one sentence of a reason. So here's why. When you provide complex reasons, I don't want to go out with you because I'm not looking for a relationship. Okay, that's option number one versus I don't date gamers. I'm not looking for a relationship. I'm celibate right now. I have problems with my health. The more reasons you provide, the more justifications you provide, the more argument you will invite. So this is something that people like, this is a very important thing to understand. When you lay a boundary with someone, it's not a discussion. The more ammo, and this is what one of the key drivers, okay? So when we lay out a boundary with someone, we want them to understand. Because if they understand, they won't push us. The more they understand about me, the more they understand about me, the more they understand about me, the easier it will be, the less friction there will be, the more they will see my perspective and the more they will respect me, and then there won't be conflict. So what we tend to do is provide reasons to try to buy ourselves peace. But in fact, what it does is the exact opposite. The more reasons we provide, the more argument we, 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 the more logic, we more reasons and more stuff we sort of say to them, it invites discussion, right? So what we want to do is ideally a very simple reason. And like, it can be like super simple, right? So it, and it's something that you want to keep like not, you don't want to justify in a way that sort of like invites argument or things like that. If they really want to ask, maybe you can answer a little bit more, but generally speaking, you can say, Hey, when we talk on the phone, uh, I'd appreciate it. Like, I, I don't, I don't find it helpful. In fact, it like makes it really hard for me to even think about this stuff, and it makes me not want to engage with you when you ask me about my romantic relationships. Going forward, when we talk on the phone, I'd appreciate it if you didn't ask me about that. Okay, so you want to make it just very, very clear. But beta, but beta, and that's where you listen to them. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. But generally speaking, what we want to do when we articulate a boundary is make a clear behavioral thing, uh, like a clear behavioral thing, an action that they can follow, right? As well as like sort of circumstances in which the boundary is like taking place. So we want to think about when, where, and what in terms of our, re our, our boundary setting, right? When are we going to enforce this? No playing video games after 10 p.m. on weekdays. And it's not, oh, I'm so worried about your future. 
I'm so worried you're going to do this. And oh, so-and-so's son is doing this. And all you ever do is play video games. Don't you understand? I love you so much. Oh my God. Like you're, I'm so worried about what's going to happen. You don't understand because you're so young. None of that crap. If you're a parent, we, unfortunately, I hate to break this to y'all Twitch, but we teach this to your parents too. And it works wonders. You lay a boundary with people. It's like clearly articulated. So no games after 10 PM period. Why? Because it's important that you focus on your school. But I do focus on my school. Cool. This is where with parents and stuff will sort of say like, you know, you need to maintain a particular GPA. Then we can talk about games on weekdays after 10 p.m. Okay? So very, very simple. You're right. It's difficult, Jake. Well, we're going to help you through that. That's where some of the pitfalls come in. So you want to provide a very simple reason. You want to make it nice and clear. Okay? Now, this is how you define or articulate your boundary. Now we're going to move on to implementing a boundary. Okay, some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is absolutely OP. Critical mistakes that people make and how to avoid them, okay? First thing is that you lay the boundary without enforcing it. At the same time. This is important. This is where a lot of people make the simplest mistake of boundaries. If I'm limiting my child's gaming, I'm not going to tell them at 10 p.m. for the first time that I'm limiting their gaming after 10. I'm going to tell them at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday or 2 p.m. on a Saturday. Hey, come this, this Monday, starting this Monday, after 10 p.m., no more games. So you don't want to tell, lay the boundary. You don't want to like explain to someone what the boundary is when you are emotional, right? And like when it's an active issue. Because what's going to happen is they're going to dismiss your concern. Because you're going to be like, they're going to be pissed, right? They're going to dismiss your concern. Because like you're active like then and there. People don't like boundary. They don't like laying out a boundary while it's being enforced. So the way that I, I want you to th think about it is like, you know, getting arrested for something that you know is breaking the law is very different from getting punished for something that you were not aware of. So if someone walks up to you and they're like, that's against the rules. I'm going to take your backpack away. And you're like, wait, what? Like, I didn't know that was against the rules. No one ever explained that to me. Like, I was not aware of this. So in that same way, we want to give people a chance ahead of time to understand what the boundary is. Because the other important thing is that if your parents are asking you, for example, about your romantic life, they want to know in that moment. So it is going to feel really, really punitive, and it's going to cost them something additional if you lay a boundary and enforce it. So we want to separate those two things out. We want people to have a lot of advance notice about the boundary before we enforce it. That way, when we enforce it, it's kind of tricky. I don't know if this sort of makes sense, but if you lay a boundary and enforce it at the same time, you're going to get a lot more pushback because they want to know in that moment what's going on in, in your romantic life, right? That curiosity or that desire, or that anxiety is there. It's going to be hard for them to respect it. But when y'all are like, let's say you're going out with your parents for grocery shopping at noon on a Saturday and y'all are going out grocery shopping and you're saying, hey, like while you're in the car, you kind of say, hey, like there's something I wanted to let y'all know. Um, I know that you guys are concerned, we'll talk about this as well, about my romantic situation and things like that. I appreciate your concern. I just want to let y'all know that whenever we talk, whenever you ask me on the phone, it really makes me like very upset and not want to talk to you. So going forward, I'm not going to really participate in any conversations about my romantic life on the phone. So you want to give them advance notice. This is key. Okay, that's going to make it easier for them to digest. Remember, laying the boundary and enforcing the boundary is going from here to here at the same time. This is the conversation two days before, right? And then enforcement is going to be this. Don't worry, we'll get here. We're just going to do it slow. Okay, so step number one, tip number one, lay the boundary and enforce the boundary separately. Give them advance notice. Okay, tip number two. For implementing a boundary, acknowledge their perspective. Whew. Once again, we're having this conversation ahead of time, right? So they're not, you're not pissed off in this moment, but you want to acknowledge their perspective. 
they will be much more likely to adhere to your boundaries if you acknowledge their perspective. That does not mean that you necessarily agree with it or that you have to cede to it, but you want to demonstrate to them, you know, like, because when you lay a boundary with someone, you want to demonstrate to them that you understand. So when you lay a boundary with someone, here's me, here's the boundary, here's the person I have a relationship with. One of the most common counter arguments is they don't understand. Oh, beta, you don't understand. You are getting old now. You don't understand. It's going to be hard. Things have to be done in their own time. Right? Like, oh, you don't understand. So what you want to do is you want to sort of deflate that by expressing your understanding ahead of time. And since it's not an argument, since they have nothing to lose, they're not going to like argue with you there. Right? So what you want to do is ahead of time, acknowledge their perspective. So you can say, hey, I understand that, you know, things should be done in a particular time. And that now that I'm 28, it's really, you feel like it's really important that I get married. Can you help me understand a little bit about why it's so important to be married at 28 as opposed to 26 or 30? Like what changes? So you can ask a question or two, right? So we're going to use some good old HG conversational techniques. Okay. You can learn this from watching what we do on stream and how we ask questions as you can also kind of, this, these are things that we explicitly teach in group coaching, right? So you can ask questions. And remember, this is not when you're enforcing a boundary, so it's a peaceful conversation. Oh, okay, I understand. So it's about kids. Yeah, I understand. So when I have my newborn pictures, it looks bad if I'm bald. Gotcha, mom. I'm with you. There's kids, there's this, there's that, there's, you know, things need to be done in their own time. Or if they can't give you a good answer, which I know is crazy, but is oftentimes going to be, uh, is going to happen. And they can't give you a concrete answer. They just think that it should be done at that time because that's culturally what they believe. So you can say, I'm not really hearing a clear reason, but it's clear to me that you feel very strongly about this and that it's very important to you. And then like when you say things like that, they can't say this. Okay. Oh, sorry. I can't see that. All right, so you acknowledge their perspective. That's going to be really important, okay? Next thing you can do is clarify their understanding. This also is going to reduce the tension when it comes to enforcement. So what does clarify their understanding mean? That means asking them what they understood about your boundary. So step number one, we're going to say when we talk about when we talk on the phone, I don't want you to ask about personal or romantic relationships. Can you help me understand why it's so important I get married now? And then what you're going to do is say, okay, so I just want to make sure we're on the same page. What did you understand about what I want to talk about on the phone and what I want to avoid talking about on the phone? So you want to ask them, just make sure we're on the same page. So just like, so, you know, what did you understand or like, what are my preferences about what's off limits on the phone? And then they'll say like, okay, you don't want to talk about marriage. Okay. Okay, great. Cool. Okay. Then what you want to do is offer them anticipatory consequences. Just so you know, mom, I'm so glad that you un understood and heard me that you don't, I don't want to talk about marriage every time we talk on the phone. That really means a lot to me. If in the future you decide to ask me, just understand that I'm going to go ahead and like politely hang up. I'm not going to like hang up on you, but I'll sort of let you know, hey, mom, I'll remind you. I'll say, hey, remember when I said I don't want to talk on the phone? And then like, I'm just going to step away from the conversation. Right? So you want to let people know what the consequences are. So, hey, son, it's Saturday at noon. noon. Starting tomorrow, uh, starting this week at 10 p.m., no gaming after weekdays until you have a 3.5 GPA. Okay? And then you, they're kind of like, uh, okay, whatever, because they're not playing then, right? It's like you're not enforcing a limit. So you're not going to encounter game rage. By the way, if you're playing after 10 p.m., no games for the next 48 hours or no games for the rest of the week, just so you understand. Okay, you do it. You didn't understand. Okay, what are we starting next week? I did things kind of out of order. What do we do? What's the rule we're starting? What did you understand about what I said? Okay, no games after 10 p.m. Okay, cool. I'm glad we're on the same page. By the way, if you do play games after 10 p.m., you're going to, uh, on a weekday, if, I, if you end up doing that, you're, I'm going to go ahead and take away the game for the rest of the week. Okay, so you want to lay out anticipatory, like, consequences ahead of time. 
So once again, the goal here is to lay this stuff out outside of the conflict. Okay? No games for 24 hours, no games for the rest of the week. You can do whatever anticipatory consequences you want, right? Especially if you're a parent. So this is really, really important. Implementing a boundary. Let's kind of recap. So once we've articulated it, that's not enough. There are all, all these important elements to implementing the boundary that we have articulated. We've figured out the what, when, how, right? Where. We figured out, we don't want to get into a bunch of reasoning, but we also want a couple of these steps when laying out the boundary. The first is that we don't want to lay it while we're enforcing it. We need to separate that emotion and conflict from enforcement from the kind of intellectual discussion and notifying people, right? It's sort of like when you get these notifications, by the way, your bill is due on the 30th. By the way, your bill is seven days past due. By the way, in two weeks, if we don't hear from you, we're going to send you to collections. This is very, very effective in terms of behaviorally sort of letting people know what the consequences are to get them to comply with particular behavior. So we want to lay out the boundary ahead of time when no one is emotionally active. Second thing is we want to acknowledge their perspective, right? So we want to say it's not about, it's not, I understand that you have feelings, you have goals. I respect those goals. It's just, I can't do this on the phone. We can talk about it in person. That's fine. But we're, I just can't do it on the phone. Clarify their understanding. You want to make sure that it's actually sinking in. Because for a lot of people, when you lay a boundary, like they're not going to, it's going to kind of go in one ear and out the other. So you want to clarify their understanding. What did you understand about this? If they don't understand, you can say it again. You can repeat it, and then you can ask them right away. It's going to kind of feel like sort of artificial or maybe even make them feel stupid, but that's okay, right? So you just want to, hey, I understand. I know it's weird that I'm sort of asking you to like again and again, but like I just want to make sure that I'm communicating clearly. You can just say something like that, okay? This is important to me. And then you want to offer anticipatory consequences. So, hey, if you do this, this is what I'm going to do. So get ready for it because you're probably going to do it. Okay? That's how you implement. Now, as you go to implement a boundary, what will happen is you will screw it up. Right? Because this is hard. And even you can sort of say, I'd love to implement this boundary. But this is where, like, as a human being... You have all kind of thoughts, goals, emotions, relationships, ego. You have all this crap floating around in your head. And that's not all aligned, right? Oh, I want to study, but damn, do I really want to play Elden Ring. I really, really don't want to hear about, I don't want my mom to ask me about marriage, but internally I'm terrified. And when I hear her speak the terror that is in my heart, it feels like emotionally satisfying in a bizarre way. It's kind of like when I'm doom scrolling after I get dumped and I'm stalking my ex on social media. Does it feel bad? Yeah. Is it addictive? Hell yeah. Right? So there are weird internal things that are going on in our body, in our mind, that cause us to screw up the boundaries that we try to set. So pitfall number one, okay? We kind of talked about this, but avoid lengthy explanations. So oftentimes, when it comes to enforcing a boundary, we want to have long conversations about it. We want to justify, hey, I'm not crazy that I'm doing this. Like, here are all the reasons why. Like, please try to understand this is hurtful for me and pay attention to me and understand me, understand me, understand me. So don't be mad. Don't be mad at me. This is a powerful emotional driver when you lay a boundary with someone. This emotional driver is the single biggest driver to why people screw up their boundaries because they don't want people to be mad at them, okay? So just avoid the lengthy explanations, avoid justifications. Why is this? Shouldn't you explain yourself? It's kind of like simple behavioral stuff where oftentimes if you look at like, if you take 100 people who provide lengthy explanations and justifications and people who don't provide lengthy explanations and justifications, 
People who don't provide lengthy explanations and justifications are just more successful at setting boundaries and having other people adhere to them. So you want to be like simple, because once you have a two hour conversation about feelings, like what was that simply articulated thing that you were supposed to do? Like, I don't even remember because now we had this deep heart to heart where like we understand each other so much better now. Sometimes that can be useful. We'll talk about when and how to have that heart to heart. Those are important, but you don't want to, you want to avoid lengthy explanations, especially at the time of enforcement. In enforcement, it's about behavior, not explanation or justification. Okay. Next up. Okay, so uh, next up is, oh yeah, this is huge. Prepare for the consequences. Okay. So now this is really tricky, but when you set a boundary with someone, there are going to be consequences for you too, right? This is something that you really, really need to understand. So oftentimes the reason that we don't succeed in laying out boundaries is because we don't really like prepare for the consequences and the consequences are so emotionally painful that we end up giving up on our boundary. And this has a devastating effect. So when I lay a boundary and I don't enforce it, what am I entraining the other person to do? What is the lesson they are learning? Think about this for a second. Yep. Very good. My boundaries can be safely ignored. What you are actually training this person to do is disrespect your boundaries. It's the exact opposite. So don't lay a boundary unless you are prepared to deal with the consequences. This is part of the other thing that's very important about how we set boundaries. This is why we don't want to go here because the consequences for this are large. The consequences for this are usually small. And essentially what we want to do is we want people to understand that once I lay a boundary, this is the hill I'm going to die on. And this is where you just want to make the consequences like relatively small for them. So even in this situation, you know, having been, this is close to home, but when, you know, parents are like, oh, beta, when are you going to get married? We're not saying you can't ever ask me about marriage. That's too difficult for your parents to handle. So it's just when we talk on the phone and when I, when we go, when we go get groceries, when we go out to eat, you can bombard me. You don't want to say that, but you want to give them a place to bombard you. And then eventually what we're going to do is tighten that boundary, right? So you can say like, hey, I understand that this is important to y'all. I really appreciate that you're, we're not talking about it on the phone. Can we go out to dinner? Like when we go out to dinner, I just want to enjoy spending time with you. I don't want to think about this stuff. I understand you're worried. We can like talk about it like once a month, like I'll come over on a weekend and we can just have one discussion about it. I'm not saying that I'm, I want to shut you down completely, but when we go out to dinner, I don't want to talk about this at all. Okay. So you have to be prepared for the consequences. First of all, they could be emotionally painful. Second thing to really think about is that people may treat you differently. Right? So you may not get invited to that party. Your friends may not ask you to queue up with them if you lay a boundary. It's possible. So you have to mentally be prepared for that. And the, the main thing here is that you have to really anticipate the consequence so that you know it's coming. And if you know it's coming, much like this, if you have anticipatory consequences, you yourself will be able to handle it emotionally better. So this is just like a general aspect of human psychology where if human beings know something is coming, they're better able to deal with it. It is the expectation of no boundary followed by the arbitrary setting of a boundary that is infuriating to deal with. And if y'all have had controlling parents, you know exactly what I mean here. Where there are some people that like, it's like you just suddenly get 15 phone calls between 9.15 and 9.45, where your parents are like, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you home yet? Why aren't you answering your phone? The reason you have a phone is to answer our calls. And you're like, where on earth is this coming from? 
And they're like, you know, you're supposed to be home by nine. And you're like, what are you talking about? We've never had this conversation before. It's infuriating. Or the parent who comes into your room and is like, why aren't you going to bed yet? You have school tomorrow. Unplug that video game right now. If you don't unplug, I'm going to throw away your computer. You see this hammer? I'm going to smash your PlayStation. And it's like, there's no anticipation. Whereas if someone kind of tells you, hey, by the way, this is going to happen at this time. We're going to shut off the internet. Right? That's dad, by the way. Not mom. Come on. Heteronormative chat. <laughs> right? So prepare for the consequences. Understand that, like, emotionally it could be painful. Maybe I'll be a little bit lonely. Maybe my parents will guilt trip me. Oh, beta, don't you understand? Your mother worries so much, beta. Are Bhagwan, do you want to be a good son? Then let me tell you how you need to get married four years ago. Do you want to be a good son? Are think about your ba. Your grandmother is in India and she is stressed so much. She has diabetes and her blood sugar is bad because you have not gotten married. Think about your ba. The guilt trip may happen, right? So be prepared for it. And it could be little things, right? So if you set a boundary with your gaming friends, they may like invite you less or like they may like be DMing you behind your back or other kinds of petty crap. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay? So you got to think about consequences, right? So prepare for them. Understand that it's going to be tough. The good news, a little reassurance here, is that human beings tend to be creatures of habit. And if you set, set a small boundary with someone, chances are they're not going to rupture the entire relationship. And this is where, like, if they're going to rupture the entire relationship because you set a small boundary with them, that's something you need to understand because this is not a relationship you can, like, win in, right? When they're willing to go nuclear every time you, like, you know, try to lay a boundary with them about taking out the trash, like, this is not a healthy relationship that you can win. Like, because, you know, a healthy relationship requires two people to be contributing. Okay? Third thing is be aware of this. We sort of talked about this a little bit, but be aware of the emotional drivers to compromising your boundaries. So number one reason that you give up on your boundaries, it's not even the other person. You give up on your boundaries is because of some kind of usual emotional driver. So like, what is your weakness? What do you have low amounts of resistance to? Do you have guilt resistance? Do you have, what if they don't like me? What if you have, let me think about this, loneliness vulnerability. I would rather be bullied than be alone. Right? So, and this is where you've got to do some, some work because like this is important because what you don't want to do is set a hypothetical boundary that you wish were true and that you wish you could enforce if you can't enforce it. So you need to think about this first and you have to really think about what am I willing to actually enforce? And that's the boundary that you should set. Okay? And like, unless you, because otherwise what you're actually doing, if you like, if you optimistically set a boundary, it's like, I'm going to a wedding and let me buy, uh, let me get my tux or my dress or whatever tailored to be like two sizes too small because that's going to be motivation for me to like lose weight because now I'm locked in. Don't do that kind of crap. You're just going to end up looking bad, being uncomfortable. Some people will succeed. It works for some people. But when it comes to boundaries, like don't do that. Set boundaries that you can enforce because if you can win this one, then you can win this one and then you can win this one and then you can win this one and then you can win this one. This is what you want to do. Okay? Gradual. So think a little bit about, okay, how am I going to feel? And when I feel that way, what am I going to want to do? Okay, I broke up with this person. I'm going to block them and be prepared for the feeling of loneliness that hits two weeks out because we're on again, off again. This has been going on for three years. We've broken up six times. So when you sort of do that, be prepared for that and be like, okay, so like, am I going to be able to resist in two weeks? Well, I need to resist. That's not the question. Are you going to be able to? What can you do to help you resist? Okay, so like it sounds like every Friday night when the loneliness hits, like I'm going to I'm going to start playing Lost Ark and we're going to schedule raids. So I'm going to be like busy during those times. 
or I'm going to turn off my phone and I'm going to put it in a different room and I'm going to like watch movies or whatever. So you have to think about your own emotional drivers and kind of work on those. Okay. Now, when it comes to in the moment. So now we've sort of thought through your emotional drivers. We've thought about the consequences of laying a boundary. You've articulated things. You've sort of, you know, given them anticipatory consequences and you lay a boundary. So how do you actually in the moment tell someone that you are enforcing a boundary? Like, what do you say? Like in that moment, right? So this is also something that we don't, I don't see this anywhere. I like, I even did a Google search for like boundary setting in preparation for this. And I just saw like all this generic crap about like, learn to say no. Like, okay, how? Like, why can't people say no? Like there's no, so this is detailed, okay? So first thing is you state the boundary. Like state it, like literally. Hey, mom, you remember what, when we talked about how like we're not supposed to, you're, you agreed not to uh, ask me about like marriage stuff over the phone. I asked you to not ask me about that and you are asking me about that now. Okay? So this is the key thing. If you can, you want to remind people of the prior conversation. Right? So you can kind of, these are, this is like very short. This is like five seconds. This is five seconds. These are not long conversations. Mom, do you remember when we talked about how you're not supposed to ask me about marriage? Okay. And then don't get bogged down in justification. If they're like, no, I don't remember. Or I, uh, because they're trying to engage you with discussion. No, but like things have changed. Like that was different. I didn't realize you were talking about this. I didn't know. I forgot. No, it's really important. Like, this is different. Like, people are going to respond to you with some kind of, like, engagement with conversation. Okay? So they will try to engage with you. Either they will dispute the conversation. In bad scenarios, they may try to gaslight you. But I think that word gets thrown around a lot. Chances are they'll justify their actions. So be prepared for justifications, disputes, arguments, all that kind of stuff. So we don't want to get into that. No explanations. They can say, you just want to listen to what they're going to say. And then you can say, okay, I, you can acknowledge if you want to here. Okay, I understand that you think that this scenario is different. And then what you want to do is consequence. So you're going to say, hey, I, I, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You can say, okay, good. I'm glad you're sorry. It seems like you understand. I'm still going to step away from the conversation. This is, a, this is critical, okay? I want y'all to understand this. No games after 10 p.m. 11 p.m. rolls around and someone is playing games. Remind of the boundary. Kid says, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Critical juncture. What does the parent do now? What does the parent do now? No games this week. You enforce the consequence. Mom, I'm so glad you understand. I'm going to go ahead and hang up. No, 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 no. But I, I said I'm sorry. Good. I'm really glad you understand that, you know, you made a mistake. That means a lot to me. Bye. I'll give you a call tomorrow. All right? So you want to kind of acknowledge their perspective. If they did apologize. Great. I'm glad you understand. Enforce. Okay? This is how people get, like, manipulated. So if you're vulnerable to manipulation, what tends to happen is you lay a boundary... They say, I'm sorry. You don't enforce. And what are you teaching the person? That I'm sorry is a substitute for respecting my boundaries. This is literally what you are behaviorally training the person to do. You're teaching them, just apologize and you can continue violating my boundaries. I'm so glad that you feel bad about taking advantage of me. 
and turning me into a doormat. Let me lay down on the floor so that you could walk all over me. Just make sure you apologize as you're doing that, because that, then everything will be okay. Okay? This is important. So once the boundary is crossed, the boundary is crossed. You can acknowledge it, but it's enforced. Okay? I'm glad you understand. So hopefully next time this happens, like, you know, next time we talk on the phone, I, I really hope that you remember this. Goodbye. Now, last thing. But does this mean that everyone will hate me? The aftermath of boundary setting. Okay? So, first thing to understand is that relationships must grow. Your relationship cannot stay static over time. It is just not the nature of relationships. So if we think about friendship, if we think about marriage, if we think about, you know, the, the parent-child relationship, right? So my relationship with my parents when I'm two is different from what it is when I'm 10, is different from what it is when I'm 20, and is different from what it is when I'm 30 and 35, right? Like that is a natural part of things. My marriage was, when I first started dating my girlfriend, our relationship was one thing. Then we were officially dating. Then we became engaged. Then we got married. Then we were like married prior to kids. And then we're married with kids. And these are all different things. Like the relationship must change over time. Relationships have to grow just like human beings do. Nothing is static. So what the key thing to understand about boundary setting is that a lot of times we feel guilty for ruining the relationship, whereas like it's okay to feel guilty right? Maybe you are ruining an aspect of the relationship. I know it sounds weird to say, but sometimes aspects of relationships need to be ruined in order for the relationship to grow. You can't just keep doing things the way that you used to as relationships change. So what you can always do, once again, this is separate from the enforcement. So there's enforcement conversation. And then like, you know, 24 to 96 hours later, there's a feedback conversation. So this is where you should like actively reach out to the person and say, you know, so give your mom a call the next day and say, hey mom, how are you? What did you think? I, I know I stepped off the phone yesterday. What was that like for you? So just ask them for feedback. What was that like for you? Okay. I'm glad we're talking. Are, you know, are you okay with what I did or did you feel hurt? Can you tell me a little bit about that? You don't have to change your boundary but you can ask to understand their perspective because this is where sometimes people get on this boundary setting like high where they start just like laying boundaries. Man, people don't respect my boundaries. Like if they don't respect me, I'm not going to respect them. And that's how you turn, how it turn into an asshole in a relationship. So it's important to lay boundaries. And it's also important to understand that some of your boundaries may be, I know it's shocking. Oh my goodness. Some of your boundaries may be unreasonable. Right? It's like, I don't want to talk about the dishes. When it's like, bro, we're roommates and you don't do your fucking dishes. I understand that it makes you upset, but like, are you going to do the dishes? Right? So th there's, there's a different person involved in this relationship. So you have to like engage with that person in the aftermath if you want to develop a healthy relationship. So you have to ask them, hey, what was that like for you? Okay? Ask for feedback. So next thing to understand is that remember that boundary setting is one step at a time. So this is something that you can gradually do over time, but generally speaking, you want to like maintain the relationship with them by asking for feedback. By the way, asking for feedback is also, uh, actually, let me move this around a little bit. So before we do this one, actually, what we're going to do is express feedback. So ask for feedback first and then express feedback. So this is where you can even express gratitude. Huge for repairing the relationship. Hey mom, th I know that I set a limit yesterday on our conversation. I'm really, really glad and happy that you didn't like call me immediately afterward and that like you answered my phone today. I, can, I imagine that you must be, or since you've already asked them, I know that you're feeling upset about that. And I'm really grateful that you're like, you know, choosing to respect my boundary here. It means a lot to me. It makes it so much easier for me to call you. And I really hope that we can talk about this because I was noticing 
that because you keep asking about this, I felt like I didn't even want to talk to you. I stopped answering your calls, and that's not the kind of relationship I want with you. So thank you so much for respecting my boundary. It's hard for people to be pissed at you when you say things like that, right? And if they're still going to be pissed at you, they're like, ah, screw you. And then like, that's someone that you may not, like, that's like a toxic person that you may want to be super careful about letting into your life, right? So you may want to set limits with them. Whereas if they're reasonable people who are willing for their relationship to grow, like this is all going to be good stuff. So oddly enough, after you enforce a boundary, expressing gratitude is a huge way to patch things up. Okay? And then last thing is process your emotions. Huge. Externally. Huge, huge, huge. So all this crap is going to leave you with emotions. This is going to be the result of emotions. These kinds of like justifications and things like that, right? Like all these complex reasons that we give people are due to our own emotions. Expressing gratitude is going to be really, really hard towards your parents if you were still pissed at them for bringing it up. I told you I didn't want you to do it. And you did it anyway. And I feel so hurt, which is fine that you feel that way, but you don't want to bring that up with them. So here's the key, key thing about like setting a boundary in summary. You want to be calm, cool, collected when setting, when enforcing, and when doing debriefing afterwards. Because if you get messed up in the head, like everything is going to get way harder. Okay. Because you want to make, keep it like nice and clean. Like we want boundaries to be clean, clean, clean. So in order for you to be calm, cool, and collected, you need to take your emotions somewhere else. Vent to a third party. Talk to a friend on Discord. Talk to a therapist. Go to your group. And talk to your group about, hey, I'm working a lot. Let's all set boundaries. Like let's work on boundaries together. Okay, this is what we're going to do this week in group. Pick a person, set a boundary. Let's all articulate the boundary ahead of time. Okay, what's your boundary? What's my boundary? What's but Okay, that sounds too complicated. That sounds like it's not going to work well. Okay, what are the anticipated problems that you're going to feel emotionally when you try to set a boundary? What are we gonna, what are the consequences that you can expect? Th we're going to think through all these things together so that we're prepared for them. Okay. Let's go do our homework. Lay that boundary. Don't enforce it. Have a conversation ahead of time. Go do this thing. Okay? And then, like, when you come in the next week in group, like, it's going to be a mess, right? Because everyone will have screwed up because this is a skill just like anything else. And then when everyone in group sort of struggles with it, then you guys are going to work, y'all are going to work together and hopefully, like, process your emotions and then you're going to try it again. Okay? So, to summarize, issue number one, healthy boundaries are important. Yet, no one teaches us how to set boundaries. Setting boundaries is a lot more than telling people what you want them to do. If you want to successfully set a boundary, you have to make it easy for them to manage. How do you make it easy for them to manage? You articulate it clearly, number one. You don't provide a whole lot of reasons, justifications, complexity, because that just invites argument and it invites discussion, and then we lose sight of the boundary. Second thing to understand is once we have an articulated boundary, we want to really separate out when we inform people of the boundary and when we enforce the boundary. Boundary enforcement is filled with emotion, filled with people getting hurt and filled with like people getting upset with each other. Because a big reason that we tend to forego our own boundaries is to maintain relationships. So we want to remove that emotion from the equation by setting the boundary ahead of time, letting people know. There are a lot of pitfalls we have to watch out for. Sometimes the biggest pitfall is ourself. We don't want to feel guilty. We don't want to feel bad. We don't want to deal with the consequences. So we end up not enforcing the boundary, which in turn entrains the exact opposite behavior, which is you're just teaching people, hey, my boundaries don't need to be respected because I'm not going to do anything to you if you don't respect them. So you can just ignore what I say. Okay. There are lots of common pitfalls that we run into, engaging in arguments, stuff like that. Next thing is when it comes down to the actual enforcement of a boundary, 
state it clearly. These don't need to be long conversations. They don't want to be complicated kinds of things. We want to separate out enforcement from debriefing and aftermath of a boundary setting. So you just say, hey, remind people of the boundary, remind people of the conversation, acknowledge their perspective, enforce, and get the hell out of the conversation as quickly as possible. Right? So what you want people to experience is the behavioral consequence as opposed to like, you said this and I can't believe that you did this and oh, I feel so hurt and like, oh my God, blah, 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 blah. And then you guys like talk for an hour, you kind of patch things up. It feels great, right? Oh, you've like strengthened your relationship. I understand you so much better now. Oh my God, I understand you so much better now. And what happens next? Gotta be careful. Sometimes that leads to positive behavioral change. Sometimes it does not. So by all means, have that conversation, but separate it out from the enforcement. So that conversation is important. That's where we get to the debrief. What should you do afterward? Talk to the person. Express gratitude. Try to understand their perspective. Maybe explain a little bit of your own. Right? Oh, I understand that you're sorry and you, you didn't realize that you were keeping track of time. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, going forward, you're going to be able to keep better tra track of time. So starting next week, it shouldn't be a problem. But what about this week? I said I learned my lesson. Good, I'm really glad. So it shouldn't be a problem next week. But my friends are raiding tonight. Okay. What do you mean, okay? Does that mean I get to play? No. We talked about no games after 10 p.m. And you played till 11 and we discussed the consequence of no gaming this week. So you can raid with your friends next week, but I'm going to miss out on loot. Okay, well, you'll miss out on loot. And it's like, that's, you know, they can say it. And this is where like, oh, loot isn't important. You got to think about what's important in life. Like, don't get distracted with all that crap, right? So you want to hear their perspective. Okay, I understand that raiding is important to you. It seems like this is a really important deal that you're missing out on raiding. I hadn't realized that. Now that you realize it, can I play? No. All right, so maybe you want to reconsider, but generally speaking, enforcement is enforcement. And then you ask for feedback. You know, you can express gratitude. You can acknowledge what people have kind of done for you. And if you're pissed, like decompress those emotions elsewhere for now. Okay? And that's how we set boundaries. Questions? Kudos, this seems like a very rigid set of rules. Yeah, so it's rigid with y'all. The cool thing is that when you do it properly, is it going to feel rigid to other people? Yes, which is what we want to do. And you're not going to come across as crazy. You're going to come across as understanding, compassionate, and firm. That's what we want with boundary setting, right? I understand what you're saying. Okay, so like this is still going to be good. That's totally fine, like. It is rigid. That's what people, they don't, we don't want to be doormats, right? And that's where like the more that you have conversations, the more that you understand their perspective, like there's going to be some rigidity because at some point you're saying no and you're putting up a wall between their actions and what you're allowing. That requires rigidity. The question is how can we optimize that process for compliance on their part as well as maintaining the relationship? Someone's asking, I've never set boundaries with my friends or family. Should I do it? Do you need to? That's for you to figure out. This is a how, not whether you should. Because what I hear far too often is like, I need to learn how to set boundaries. I have terrible boundaries. We see this all the time. I have terrible boundaries. Okay, so like, what are we going to do about that? Right? Like everyone's like, oh my God, I have terrible boundaries. People don't respect my boundaries. Okay, like, what are we going to do about it? Like, how? Love yourself more. Like, just learn how to say no. Like, it doesn't work. Like, this is not just learn how to say no. This is like lots of steps. And there's a reason why we have all those steps. Each of these steps will mitigate the damage, mitigate the emotions, hopefully salvage the relationship as best as you can. The other thing is that when you do this kind of stuff, like, you know, if people are reacting very, very badly to it, this is why we ask for feedback. And this is not like ask for feedback and ignore what they say, like really pay attention to them because you may be bad at setting boundaries. And if this is the other thing to understand is that sometimes you sort of need like a friend transplant, 
like a friend group transplant. Because if you're with a group of people who really does not like boundaries being set on them, and you start enforcing boundaries, you may have to gravitate towards people who are like, will respect boundaries. And maybe your entire friend circle won't. So that can sometimes happen. Are boundaries ever worth being challenged? Or is that toxic? Of course they're worth being challenged. Because who says that the boundary that you set is not toxic to begin with? Right? So I have a boundary that I'm never going to take out the trash. That's my boundary. I need you to respect that. It's like, that's not fair to me. Right? So this is a relationship has mutual elements. This is something that I see a lot, especially on the internet. If someone will frame a problem in a particular way, like, oh, like so-and-so, like, they're not respecting, like you frame, because it's like you're biased, right? So you ask the internet for advice. And the internet is like, pitchforks, pitchforks, pitchforks. Screw that person. They're not respecting your boundaries. Where it's like, you, you know, the internet doesn't ask questions like, okay, like when, they've, when they try to respect your boundaries, how do you sabotage them? Which happens a lot, right? We self-sabotage when it comes to boundaries. Like maybe you should work on that. A boundary is not, just because you set a boundary does not make it objectively correct. So be reflective. How to set a boundary with yourself to not make myself suffer? Coming up. Coolest Herald. So what if one part of us feels like setting boundaries isn't a good idea? That's completely normal. The reason that boundaries are so hard to set is because there's almost always a part of you that doesn't think it's a good idea. That's why they're so freaking hard to set. Like, why do you think it's so hard? It's not because of other people. It's because of you. Like, the reason we're bad at setting boundaries is because of our own emotional needs. I don't want people to dislike me. I don't want people to be mad at me. It's going to be mom and dad are going to make a real mess of things if I set a boundary with them. My friends won't invite me over if I set a boundary with them. There's always going to be a part of you that does not want to set a boundary. Now, this is where it's not like absolutely correct that you should listen to that or absolutely correct that you should ignore it all the time. Like that's not what the scope of this conversation is. That's what you have to figure out. Like where is the dividing line? What is an okay amount of boundary to set with people? And understand that some people may not like it, which is completely normal. Yeah, so someone saying, I try to set boundaries and they still do the said thing, that's where I'd ask you, what are the consequences? When someone violates their bo your boundary, what are the consequences? If there aren't consequences, people aren't going to respect your boundaries. And you're like, but I don't have the ability to set consequences. Okay, well, that's different. So if you're like a 14-year-old and you're under the control of your narcissistic entitled parents, you may not be able to set a boundary with them. That's unfortunate, but it could be true. And if that's the case, that's where it's like you just got to bide your time and time is on your side because eventually you'll become independent and then you can set whatever boundaries you want to. And that's when they're going to say, I'm sorry. And that's when you're going to say, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that and I'm not inviting you to my wedding. right? Good. I'm very happy to hear you say that. But I said, I'm sorry. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you so much for saying that. But we want to come. Well, it's like the psychological damage that you've done over me, uh, to me over the past 15 years can't be wiped away with two words. And maybe, you know, I'm, I'm happy that you said you're sorry. I'm happy to try to patch things up for you. But I don't think that's going to happen within three months. And I want my wedding to be a day where I can be like happy and full, free of stress. And generally speaking, that has not been my experience with you. Does that hurt? Is it an oof? Yes. I mean, it's okay to say that. Right? You can acknowledge. You can say like, because here's the thing. When they say, I'm sorry, and you say, okay, all is forgiven. Come to the wedding. What are they going to do at the wedding? Exactly what they've done for the last 15 years.
right? It's the fact that they say you're sorry and you compromise your boundaries that gets you in this situation in the first place. So, and some people may be like, oh my God, this guy's such a rigid asshole. It's like, okay. I mean, I really don't think so, but I've been pushed to this. Do you, does that make sense to you? I've tried everything else over the last 15 years and it doesn't seem to be working. So this is the best I can come up with. What if it's unfixable after the wedding? Then it's unfixable after the wedding. Right? So the only, the only reason that things are unfixable is when one party decides that they're unfixable. Otherwise, you can keep working at it. Right? A relationship can keep on improving as long as both parties are trying. And if they feel so hurt that they're willing to sever their relationship with you because you did not invite them to their wedding and they miss this milestone of your life, and they're willing to end the relationship, that is exactly why you're not inviting them to the wedding. It is the consequence of, we will never talk to you again if we don't come to the wedding. It is that thought that they have planted in your head, which is exactly why you need to set a boundary with them. Does that make sense? So this is, it's, it's a beautiful sentence. What if they never talk to you again? That's like exactly what I'm saying, man. Like, look at this. Or woman. I don't know. Um, so this is the emotional drives, compromising your bound, boundaries. Guilt. What if they don't like me? That's how they, that's how they propagate. Right? That's how people take advantage of you, is because there are powerful emotional drivers. What if my parents never talk to me again? Right? You can, like, that's where, like, you do your dharma. So you, they say, like, oh, like, you know, maybe they'll say, if you, if you don't invite us to our wedding, we're never talking to you again. And that's where you can say, like, yeah, this is exactly why I don't want you there, because anytime I try to set a limit with you, you just resort to emotional blackmail. You're threatening me with destroying a relationship when I'm setting a limit with you. This is exactly why I don't want you at my wedding. Does that make sense to you? But, 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 no, no, but it's such an important occasion. Then you don't want to get down the important occasion route. Okay. Yeah, I understand it's an important occasion. That's why, you know. And then like, you know, when Christmas rolls around or when it's their birthday or whatever, they, they may say, we never want to talk to you again. You can still call them. You can still send them a card. And they get to rebuff you over and over again. And each time that you reach out the hand of peace and they swat it away, you can rest easy at night knowing that you've done your job and that this is a truly unreasonable person. So this is where, like, you know, for three years on their birthday, you call them and you send them cards and they don't answer. They send your cards back. And then they find out, then you stop sending cards and they find out through social media that you have a kid. They'd love to meet their grandson. What do you say at that point? Right? You can, I wouldn't recommend being punitive, but you can sort of like, for three years, I sent you all birthday cards and called you and you didn't want any kind of relationship with me. Help me understand what's changed. Well, now we have a grandson. Okay, so like, so I'm hearing that you don't want a relationship with me, you want a relationship with my son. Well, no, we want a relationship with you too. Then why didn't you ever pick up my, why didn't you ever answer the phone? Well, because it was hard for us. Okay. Well, I, I'd really appreciate it if you could think through that and, and help me understand what's going on. Because so far what I'm seeing is that when there's something in it for you, you answer the phone. I'm not seeing that you're demonstrating that like what I want out of this relationship is important at all. Well, what do you want out of the relationship? I wanted some kind of contact over the last three years. Well, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it going forward, but why wasn't it fixed before? I want to understand this. Like, I'm not saying I want contact going forward. I've let go of that. I tried for three years to build a relationship with you and was rebuffed. What I wanted was you to answer the phone three years ago. Well, I can't do that. Okay, so then what are you expecting from me at this point? 
Got to teach people that their actions have consequences. Thanks for the gifted subs. Shall we move on? Right, so this is where, like, you don't want to be mean. So this is where, like, saying those kinds of things seems harsh, but it's not like, I hate you. You're a terrible parent. You don't want to ever say, I mean, you can imply those things if you want to, but you yourself should, like, let go of that crap. Does that make sense? You can say, like, yeah, I understand that you want, but, like, just state to them, like, I'm... I don't hear from you for five years, and now that you have a grandson, suddenly you're reaching out? Like, I'm so confused. Over the last five years, you've given me every indication that you do not want a relationship. And now I'm concerned about, like, this kind of person, letting this kind of person into my son's life. Because what I'm seeing from you is that when you want something, you pick up the phone. But when I want something, you don't answer. And I'm not interested in having someone like that be a central part of my, my son's life. Does that make sense to you? But, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, I, I heard what you said, but did you hear what I said? Does it make sense to you that I would not want someone, when I need something and I call that person, they don't answer the phone. And when they want something, they pick up the phone and call them, or call, call me when they need something. Do you understand, remember we're asking for understanding, why I would not that want that kind of person as part of my son's life? Well, but, 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 okay. So then they say, they dissimulate again, right? So then you can say, okay, so this is part of the problem is that I've said something to you twice and I'm not hearing you acknowledge it at all. So I'm going to go ahead and hang up now. In order for this to work, you need to be able to acknowledge and understand my perspective, which is exactly what I think the problem has been thus far. Goodbye. If, these, uh, if my parents learn these techniques I'm done for, you're damn right you are. We're teaching it to them. Because here's the thing. Generally speaking, when parents learn their techni these techniques, the kids hate it for like three months, and then their life starts getting better, and then they're grateful. Sorry. But, yeah. Yeah. So at this point, it's irreversible? No, it's not irreversible, but like they need to acknowledge, right? It's not irreversible. But it's like unless they're going to make some acknowledgement of what you've done, been through, and demonstrate some kind of understanding, then like you're just signing yourself up for more of the same. So this is the kind of thing where if, if y'all are stuck in life, chances are it's because you're, it's not because your parents were too harsh. Chances are they did a bad job of setting boundaries on you. And for those of you who say, my parents were super controlling, super controlling is not the same as setting boundaries. This is important to understand. So like being super controlling is usually about arbitrary boundary enforcement. If you think your parents were like set to, I mean, like, does that make sense? Your parents didn't do the crap that I was telling. This is good parenting. This is how you set a, pair, a boundary with a child. You let them know what's coming. You give them an opportunity to act in the right way. You give them ample opportunity to act in the right way. You make sure everyone is on the same page. You make sure they understand. You ask them for feedback, even as a parent. What do you think about that? I think that one week was way too harsh. And that's when you can say, okay, fine. So if you think it was too harsh, it sounds like you're adhering now. So if you step, if you make a mistake again, it'll be like three days. How does that sound to you? And that's when the kid is like stuck. Because it's like you're, you're moving in the right direction. So do they throw it in your face and say no? And you're like, okay. Or do they like, they, do they take the win? Do they take the W? And build a relationship with you? And do you demonstrate to them or do they choose to be pissed? No, it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, let me know if you change your mind. And then they, they step over the line again. If you want to be like, a good parent, then what you do is, hey, you remember last time when I asked you, you make a mistake again, are we going to ban it for a week? Or are we going to ban it for three days? And you said it doesn't matter. I'm curious, which one should we do this time? And then the kid is like, what's your angle? My angle is that I'm your parent and I love you and I, I want you to do well in school, but I don't want to harshly punish you. And you said that last time it was harsh punishment. And then when I asked you about three days, like you didn't seem to care. So I'm asking you again, like, which one do you think is more appropriate? Like, 
three days. It's like, okay, cool. So if you screw up on Thursday or Friday, because today's Monday, then we're probably going to have to push out to a week. But if you can manage Thursday and Friday fine and you're fine all next week, like three days seems more appropriate. What do you think? Like, meh. So setting healthy boundaries is like really good for kids. It's how you learn how to regulate yourself. So many of the problems in our community is because parents haven't set healthy boundaries on you. They haven't taught you how to set healthy boundaries, which is why you don't teach the, you don't set them with other people. Y'all get that? Right? So like, and that's why like no one teaches us this stuff. Parents, no one teaches parents this stuff. It's not their fault. We're not saying that parents are like bad people. It's just like no one teaches this crap. And like, can you imagine how hard it is to be a parent in today's day and age where it's like there are people like grooming other people on the internet and your parents have to try to keep you safe, your fucking dumbass 15 year old self. They're trying to keep you safe. It's so stressful. And like now they have to deal with like addictive video games. Right? Like that's so much worse. It's like so much harder. It's like screwing up kids' brains even more. And so it's like, it's not easy for them. And I think generally speaking, I mean, hopefully you have parents who love you. If you don't, you have my sincere apologies. But it's hard. And sometimes like, you know, <laughs> the simplest job of a parent is to keep a child from screwing themselves over. It's like, you know, that's like literally like what your job is as a parent. It's like just to, you know, kid is like playing with a paper clip and an electrical socket. And it's like, you just, you need to stop that, Right. Kid is like, I'm going to jump off the roof and fly. Like, you need to stop that. Kid is like, I'm going to destroy my sense of habit and dopamine circuitry through excessive gaming. Like, as a parent, like, you need to stop that. We're not saying don't play games. We're not saying don't let your kids play games. We're saying, like, we're not saying, also, remember, no gaming on weekdays after 10 p.m., okay? On a weekday, on a school night. We're not saying no gaming on weekdays. Healthy gamer. Yeah, absolutely. So I see that a lot of people are asking questions about OCD and PTSD, stuff like that. I think, um, oh, do you set boundaries differently with kids with ADHD? They just become, so these are all good questions. I think first thing is that, you know, if you're dealing with someone who has these problems or you yourself have these problems, definitely a good idea to talk to a provider about it. But generally speaking, I'd say, yes, it does modify the implementation of all of these things. So for example, someone with complex PTSD may be a lot more vulnerable to their internal emotional drives than the average person. This is a case by case basis why you need to talk to a clinician because it's not like I, I can't think of as, I've, I haven't read a single study about boundary setting as a person with C, CPTSD before. So I don't know if there's research on that. That gets to that level of specificity. That's why you need a clinician. But generally speaking, I find that people who have experienced trauma or have a particular sum scar or things like that, there's a part of this process that these aren't equally difficult parts of the process. Some people are really good at articulating. Some people are really good at like, you know, dealing with the emotional stuff. Some people are really good at emotionally processing afterward. Some people are like emotionally terrified of ever speaking to someone after setting a boundary with them. Right? So that's where, you know, it just kind of depends. ADHD, this is very important for ADHD. So there's a lot of stuff about like boundary setting where because of the attentional component, the anticipatory part is very important with ADHD. So that's where like you need to let them know like not just the Saturday before the Monday, let them know a week ahead of time, five days, three days, the day before. Lots of reminders. Because of their variable attention, it may not sink in. This is also why you want to have them articulate their understanding. Because this is where like a lot of times what happens is kids with ADHD who are usually smart will use context clues to figure out what you want them to say. It's tricky. They don't actually hear you. They're just so friggin' smart that they figure out what the right answer is. And so what you want to do with ADHD is make sure you articulate their understanding and give them lots and lots of anticipatory guidance. And also, I would, I would suggest being like less harsh with 
consequences and give them just it takes a slow it down with ADHD, like more warnings, smaller steps, a lot of conversation in between.